keep going. Feel free to just keep going. Just keep it going as loud as possible. That's fine. You don't have to stop. There's no need to stop. No need to stop clapping. Why did you stop clapping? Uh, hi. Welcome to On The Verge. I'm Josh Topolsky, Editor-in-Chief of The Verge. And uh, we're very happy to have you guys here. Very excited for you to be here. Uh, you guys don't know this, my parents are in the audience tonight. They're right over there. Give them a round of applause. They, they, uh, they, they literally made me out of nothing. I think it's impressive. Uh, they didn't really work that hard, though, did they? Um, so really happy to be here. Uh, you guys uh, may know that this is our last show of the season, which is exciting. But I'm happy to be here because I recently had heart surgery, uh, and I'm alive. It was minor heart surgery, though. They didn't actually open my chest. They did shave my chest. I'll be talking about this later <laughs> in graphic, sexy detail. Uh, but if I collapse or something, just call 911 uh, and tell them that I've recently had heart surgery. That won't actually happen. I, you know, I said I wasn't going to do the 911 joke, and I did it anyhow. Why? <laughs> What's wrong with me? Anyhow, um, we have a big show. Uh, we have a big, exciting show. Uh, John Underkoffler from Oblong Industries is here. We're going to talk about crazy, yeah. We're going to talk about crazy Minority Report style computer. We're actually going to talk about Minority Report a lot, which I know you guys want to hear about. Um, and uh, that's exciting. We also have a video we went to Oblong. Ross Miller took a trip out there, which is cool. Um, Dieter Bone, one of our West Coast editors. He's also a human, but he's an editor mainly. Uh, he interviewed the CEO of Research in Motion, Torsten Hines. So he's kind of like talking about their new devices, which I know you guys are all going out to buy, like, ASAP. <laughs> so, like, your nervous laughter, like, how do I tell them I'm not doing that? Um, and, uh, no, you might. You never know. Come on, give it a chance. Um, and, of course, Paul and Neil are here. They have all kinds of uh, funky shenanigans to talk about. I think they're actually called funky shenanigans. That's their new act. Um, and uh, I want to say our sponsor tonight is Ford. They've been an awesome sponsor. Uh, this, is our, this is our last show of the year. They're kind of taking us home. And uh, we actually have a, a video that Paul uh, is in. He's driving around a Ford car later, which is kind of fun and funny and weird and uncomfortable. But uh, only because of Paul, not because of Ford. Uh, so why am I wasting your time? I think we should just start things. Uh, so let's get the show underway. Good. You're supposed to clap until the music ends, and I'm very disappointed in all of you, especially my parents. Um, so uh, we have a lot of news to talk about. We have a lot of stuff happening tonight. We've got, and this show is actually, it's going to be a lot of fun. And if it's not fun, it was free, so you can't really argue with that. I've used that joke a lot. It still works. I'm happy. Uh, we should just get underway. So please welcome Paul Miller and Neil Patel, Esquire. <laughs> Yes, yes, bring it, bring it over, bring it in here. Let me just lead you over to this right there. Very, very good, how are you? So good to see you. Good. Keep going, yeah, that's good. That's good, that's good. Really good, just right there, right, that's your seat Thanks. right there. Thanks. Okay, great. Good. Great, great job walking out. Thank I like I mean, when it comes to people who can walk out, yeah. you guys are the best yeah. In the industry. Well, you know, we've been practicing because we're about to take our show, uh, Funky Shenanigans, on the, on the road. road. Yeah, Funky Shenanigans yeah. is touring the U.S. Uh, yeah. all through the winter yeah. and into the spring. That's why we have to And stop we do a lot show. of walking on and off the stage during the show. And That's so. actually our main Funky Shenanigan. Yeah. It's walk, like, it's walk like, it out. It's the highlight the of the show. The show is really short. It's like a <laughs> walk out, wave, and yeah. then walk back. Yeah. Anyhow, enough of these shenanigans. Um, so we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of news has happened recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys may, not, may or may not know this. Uh, but uh, we run a website called TheVerge.com. We do. It's online. Actually, before we get into news, let me talk about my heart thing, because I think it's cool. <laughs> and we were talking about this before, and I was like, you know, I, when I was actually going in for the surgery, I was uh, thinking, like, we should do a feature on this, um, which is a sick problem that I yeah, have. Yeah. Where, where, um, they're, like, starting to cut me open, and I'm like, this would be great if we shot a video. <laughs> um, but, but so I, have, I had this thing. They say they got it, though I don't actually believe them. Like yeah. the, the doctors tell me they fixed it, but I, I had this heart defect called supraventricular tachycardia. And what happens is 
um, the nerve in your heart that gets this electrical signal to beat, it has like an extra node on it, and the electrical signal gets caught in a feedback loop, mm -hmm. which is a cool like tech problem it's to like have. It's like a denial of it's like, it's like a DDoS on your heart. Yeah, right. DDoS. And your heart starts like freaking out, it's really uncomfortable, and you feel like you're gonna die and you call an ambulance. Um, so what they do is they put these catheters in like your groin, groinal area, your crotchal <laughs> area, and they like snake them up into your heart and they uh -huh. burn out the offending node with uh, Radio frequencies, yeah, like and so they just and they shave your chest just because they want to. They shave. See they do it. shave your chest because if they screw it up or something goes wrong, they have to give you a pacemaker, okay. which is like my biggest fear. Yeah, like being an eighty-year-old guy at my age, like I have a pacemaker. Yeah. Um, so they have to chest. shave your chest just in case I got to go in. They didn't go in, but now my chest is really. Well, you, you cut through the water <laughs> with the greatest of ease. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I'm a great swimmer. <laughs> Thanks, <Dad. laughs> Anyhow, um, so so it's actually kind of a cool. Like as far as problems with your heart go, yeah, it's sort of a it's cool the best like one to have. it's sort of a cool tech problem to have. Yeah, yeah. like you're, I've got uh, a weird feedback loop. You're overclocked. I'm overclocked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Anyhow, but I'm but I'm I'm good now, and I'm excited about it. And mm -hmm. so. are you ready? Are you ready to love? Yeah, I'm ready to love again. Well, that's good. <laughs> it's functioning at almost full capacity. Wow. Well, I love um, you. Well, Thank you. <laughs> like, just so upsetting. Just, just wanted to when somebody you tells up. you they love you in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> You're like, man, did you see that game last? I love you. It's like, what's <laughs> happening? I don't want that now. Yeah. Um, anyhow, but we do have a big, uh, a big list of things to talk about. We do. Um, last week, I don't know if you guys saw this on the site, but we did this War for TV series, and we talked about how like the, um, the ecosystem battle is coming to the living room and everybody wants to get in on the television. Everybody's trying to do smart TVs, everybody's trying to do like their second screen experience. Um, and and Neil I wrote a bunch of stuff. Everybody did. We did interviews. Yeah. It's okay. huge. And we're actually tomorrow I think we're gonna have a big roundup post of all the stuff so you should check it out. But this is the next frontier. I feel like mobile is kind of starting to level out. Tablets are starting to level out a little bit. Mm -hmm. TVs, that stuff is changing. Yeah. And 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 who's who's gonna win this? Like who, who's going to win? Is it Verizon? Is it Apple? Paul, I'm going to put this to you. Yeah. Google? Is it, is it Amazon? Well, is it's it Netflix? It's obviously necessary because everything sucks right now. And I think... Everything is the worst. Everything is the worst. Yep. And, and I think the model th that I like the best is Netflix. I just don't think Netflix as a company is very smart. So I think it's probably like Amazon or Apple taking maybe Netflix's model and doing it well. I just feel like how does Netflix compete with like a monolith like exactly. Amazon well, get, or Google? They get Google. absorbed. You know, they get, yeah. They get absorbed. Yeah. That's how they compete. Well, yeah. It's uh, not really, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you ever read the definition of competition, but, <laughs> but when you're absorbed by the thing you're competing against, it's usually like a bad thing. Uh, Have you ever seen the movie I'm The sure Blob? I'm sure Reed Hastings would be like, <laughs> like, he's I like, beat the blob, it just absorbed me. <laughs> yeah. He'd be like, no. he's getting on his j private jet, he's like, that was a great competition. Like, I, I won. I, I played hard, yeah. Um, but So who do you think is going to win? You know, it's really interesting. We've been talking to people throughout the industry, and it's, Everybody knows that everything sucks, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's weird because everybody it's like you know what a smartphone kind of looks like now. Right. It's a screen, and you know what PCs are starting to look like tablets, and there's going to be that's going to shake itself out. But we have an idea of how that market's going to go. Nobody knows how to get from from where we are now to what we want television to. Right. And it's just like terrible, rocky do, I mean, terrain. Do we want television? To I feel like television doesn't need to change that much. I feel like one major thing needs to happen. Right, you need to put TV in all these other boxes. No, right? wrong. What's that? I just need to be able to watch whatever I want to watch, when I want to watch it, and like the next season of Downton Abbey should be finished already, <laughs> and I should be able to watch that right now. <laughs> like yeah. all the seasons of every show, like Six Feet Under was six seasons. Right. Mm -hmm. They should have just done those in one shot. Yeah, and then so I could just all a cart watch the whatever made, I wanted. TV shows should be thirteen-hour movies that you can watch as you want. I mean, that's yeah. like that's what they are. The model. That's the yeah. Netflix model. Yes, uh, this is what Netflix is Netflix. doing. Right, so, but everybody knows that's where you want to go. And I think it's if you look at what happened in music, it took Steve Jobs like cajoling five huge companies to like participate. They also had in to be brought. Marketplace. They have to be brought to their knees by theft. And that's what's happening in TV. No, that's but, what's but happening it, in TV. It, but like, it's much harder to steal theft. like a gig. No, show. Not. If you're a college student, you're on a college. Okay, if you're internet. a college student, but they but don't. So well, I don't know if you noticed, but college students don't run the world. They, so the the CEO of Time Warner. Have you seen the metrics no, of the, the voting? Have you heard Cable. the Beyonce song? Who runs the world? It's, it's girls. Girls. Yeah. Girl, uh, girl college students. No, but they're. Uh, <laughs> girl college students. Somebody was really excited. Somebody here. That's not a good said. song. It's like, <laughs> it's like an okay, it's like a C plus. Beyonce, but it's true. Those women. Which man, is like an A plus for everybody else. They're in charge. Uh, are they not guys? Yeah. Well, no. It's uh, you know the the problem is not us cutting the cord, it's people never buying cable. 
And that's like a real problem. Well, Ari Emanuel doesn't think that's a problem. Mm, people aren't buying cable. Well, who, who here has cable? It's, it's everybody. It's that's everybody. a quarter of our audience. <laughs> everybody here has cable. Why? <laughs> what is Paul doesn't cable? have cable? You know what's great about cable? There's these two music channels that are in SD, um, <laughs> and they're so bad. Yeah. They're, Fuse, by the way, is like a music channel that doesn't show music. Canada. It shows, like, Canada yeah. it shows like 15 seconds of a song. It's like, you get the idea. Yeah. Like, I, <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't understand that. It is like literally like the top 40 counts. I'm like, okay, cool. And it's an hour long and everything is 15 seconds. Yeah. And it's like, here's a little bit of the part before Just the chorus. Search, search for this on Vivo. You know, you know what yeah. this is going to do, right? <laughs> Moving on. Here's the new Christina Aguilera song. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, so but we don't actually know the winner. We don't know who's going to be the winner. I think we it's, it, it, it's going to take a giant of the industry to like make some real changes. <laughs> Verizon, yeah. Comcast. It's yeah. gonna be. We're gonna end up with the same people. Yeah. All right. Anyhow. Uh, so another news. That's where we really ended that. Like going no. nowhere. That was just us. It's just rough. Like, you know, it's gonna be the winner. Well, not you know, the consumers. Not the consumer loses. No yeah. matter who wins, we. Well, lose. you know who's gonna win. Just like he, aliens uh, versus predator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have I mentioned a predator. Have I mentioned the yeah. predator on every show this year? Mm -hmm. I think I have. Um, so the other thing that just happened, other piece of news that just happened, is the Wii U launched. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you... Ow. Oh, because Nintendo comes out with a new console all the time, and now it's really you, cool. If you follow me on Twitter, <laughs> uh, the social network, yeah. the real-time social media network, uh, you'll know that I was up till 5 in the morning last night playing Zombie U. Have you guys seen Zombie U? Do you know what it is? Does anybody know what the Wii U is here in this audience? <laughs> uh, tepid, I played Zombie That's U. wonderful tepid applause, and I really enjoyed that. Zombie U, I turned the lights out, and uh, this happened. And uh, I was playing it late, and it scared that. It scared the shit out of me. I'm going to just be honest with you. I mean, I actually jumped. Your dad looks very He's terrified. Funny. He's very upset. Like, he's, uh, <laughs> my father, by the way, like reads the comments, and he's like, so they're right. You you talk over people. You gotta stop doing that. <laughs> they're like the. You guys think you're like the commenters are trollish. <laughs> they have nothing on my parents. They're like the meanest people in the world. But they're also wonderful. <laughs> this, wow. is not, this is not this is not well. It's not going well. Anyhow, but you yes, my father is very. Just go, like, my father is very upset about my profanity, but it is scary. Yeah. And I think it's kind of amazing. I thought the Wii U was like, eh, whatever. Yeah. And then I read the Polygon review of Zombie U, and I was like, I gotta get one right now. Luckily. Uh, Sam Sheffer, who runs our social stuff, was like, oh, yeah, I have a couple extra systems. Just laying around. Yeah. yeah. For, off of, fell off the back of a truck. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever. Um, Paul, you got a Wii U. Yeah, I bought it off Sam, too. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Do you great. like it? Well, I haven't opened up the box yet. Wow. Everybody at the office... Wait, freaked, a, wait a Christmas morning. That everybody yeah. was like, there's a mandatory a verb? like patch like when you open, turn on the... Oh, right. Yeah. It has to download something from the internet. So I don't know what's going to happen. God, you, you're, you're, <laughs> six months from now, you'll be able to play the Wii U. I it's going to be really, <laughs> really have, amazing. I'm going to have it just around. It's gonna, it looks cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, as long as that is so, enough for you. We'll Does Zombie happens. U use the... the yeah, so what's cool, I don't know if you guys understand, the Wii U has a, like a tablet controller mm -hmm. and a console. And so like in Zombie U, when you're doing things on the screen, on your TV screen, you get a map on your, um, on your tablet controller. And, and if you want to get into your backpack to get stuff out, like a, like a board to hit the zombies with, or a, a carbine rifle to shoot <laughs> them in the face with, or a yeah. handgun, yeah. or like a Molotov cocktail, all things that I've um, used on <laughs> zombies in Zombie them. U. But, but you, like, you go into the backpack on the screen, and the person on the screen like, is unprotected, like going through their backpack. So you see a zombie and you have to like, in. get into your backpack and pull something out. It is terrifying, though. Like, so here's what's really weird about Zombie U, and then we should move on. But what's really weird about Zombie U is that you only play as one character, and then you die. And you start over, and that character that you played as is dead in the game and is now a zombie. So, like, there's periods in the game where you're, you get something, you're like, should I stash this somewhere and leave it because I know I'm going to die? And then, like, when my new person is, like, born into this world, I can go get the thing off of them. Like, I've actually killed myself in the game to get a gun from them, <laughs> which is really weird. Like, it's just a really weird way to think about Josh, things. Josh, I have never seen you so sincerely passionate about something. Well, yeah. I, except for like maybe day one of The Verge, but other yeah, than that. Yeah, it's been downhill it's, ever since. It, it, it's it's like you're kind of excited about the right. launch of our site, but right. um, it's just, look, I haven't been scared by a zombie game since like the original, original Resident Evil. You do you remember the original Resident Evil? When the zombies would burst through the window? Yeah, yeah. Well, that was scary. <laughs> 
I just love to be scared right. by zombies. I'm very, very Look, just go get one. I'm not, by it. the way, I'm not I'm shooting for detention. I actually more. thought I wouldn't yeah. like this thing, and I'm, like, surprised that I like it. All right, moving on. I'm not surprised. Moving on. Steven Sadovsky, have you heard of him? He's a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's a character in Zombie You. He attacks you. He's like, check out this easy-to-use yeah. touch interface. Um, <laughs> Steven Sadovsky Steven was at Microsoft. He ran Windows. He recently resigned. Uh, there's been in a lot turmoil. of... In turmoil. In turmoil. Yeah. Well... We don't know what his state was. Yeah, you know, we don't well, know what's going on with him, but we, we, it, it seemed a little weird. And, um, and, and Scott Forstall uh, recently resigned from Apple, who was, like a, you know, was running iOS. He's the guy who made iOS what it is the last few years. So you've got these big software guys who've recently resigned with big, big products they just put out. And um, we think it's kind of, you think it's kind of a trend. I think it's, a, it's, it's the end of jerks. The end of jerks. Is the end of Neil jerks. I, I think, is what Neil Patel has dubbed it. Uh, yeah, I think I think people don't want to work for jerks, I, and I think that's like a problem at these big companies where mm. they they these leaders who are perceived as not nice people. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I Watch hope I don't yourself. have to change my management style. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you went out, Neil went out onto the street. Yep. And accosted regular humans to talk about uh, jerk jerk bosses. Yeah. Whether right? they want to work for jerks or pushovers. Yeah. So take a look at this video, and we we will be uh, right back. It's highly entertaining. In the past couple weeks, two very high-profile jerks have been fired. Scott Forstall's out at Apple, Steven Snopsy's out at Microsoft. But the thing is that you kind of need a jerk if you're going to make something in this world. You need a leader, you need somebody with vision. Somebody's going to get angry when they don't get what they want. So we're out here in New York City to ask people what kind of boss they want to work for, a jerk or a pushover. So would you rather work for a jerk or a pushover? Uh, pushover. I think I'd rather work for the jerk. Yeah, I would rather work for the jerk. So would you rather work for a jerk or for a pushover? A pushover. A pushover? Why would you rather work for a pushover? Because you can push him over. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think a better boss is a pushover instead of a jerk? Uh, because then I have a little bit more control in the situation. I don't have to deal with a negative residue. What is negative residue? Ew, where you just have to confront someone. <laughs> hard, no, it's a real thing. Look it up. Lot. Google negative <laughs> residue. What? I mean, I, I have a number of residue-related questions to ask you. So let it go. Uh, yeah, I let it go. Would you rather work for a jerk or a pushover? Um, a pushover. Oh, I guess I'd rather work for a pushover. Would you rather work for a jerk or a pushover? A jerk. I'd rather work for a jerk. A jerk? Yeah. Well, it's a challenge. Would you rather work for a jerk or a pushover? Pushover. The jerk, I, I don't want to be sexist, but if they don't like you, they can make your wife miserable, that's all. Why would that be sexist? <laughs> well, female. <laughs> I like go to jail. Well, You're not going to go to jail. Uh, worst boss I've ever had was probably um, working for, like, can't say the name. I'm not going to name names or anything. The worst boss I've ever had, um, Ray Brown. <laughs> Say the name. <laughs> Shame him, bo Ray Brown. You are a jerk. If you had to characterize yourself as a boss, which one are you? Uh, pushover. <laughs> yeah, pushover. More than a jerk. Yeah. Your friend's laughing at you, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're just doing some interviews about uh, like the workplace and like it's how you like it. Oh, it's so good. Hey, I'm not going to speak English very well. I'm sorry, man. I'm not going to speak English. Yeah, me too. Can't yeah, believe I have to work this hard. This is just like the worst. Like, it's like Friday afternoon, everyone's going home, it's super cold, uh, and I have to be out here doing my little song and dance for my jerk boss. This is great. I wonder if Josh knows I'm here. So what have we learned today? We've learned that although it's no fun, most people know they need to work for a jerk. They need somebody with vision, leadership. Somebody who's going to get the job done, get the project off the ground. But just as inevitably, the jerks get replaced. with somebody younger, somebody more handsome, somebody who's frankly more well-liked. So here's to you, Steven Sanofsky. And here's to you, Scott Forstall. And here's to you, Josh Topolsky. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Josh, I trust you. Uh, what, to I me. Think Neli was, what I think Neli was trying to say. Yes. <laughs> what was he trying to say, Paul? <laughs> Do you really want to? Do you really want to uh, hit your wagon to this train? Is that <laughs> what you do with the wagon? There's, there's, there's I think also, so. <laughs> to this horse? I don't know. I've never heard of the 
of the servant leader. Wow, you really killed everybody with that one, didn't you? That is a, that is a vibe killer yeah. right there. It's not a jerk, but not a pushover. Anyhow, so, uh, so <laughs> when you lead your mutiny, Paul, I would. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like the, I don't like the, I don't like the sounds of anything that you're talking about. And so I'm just going to segue out of whatever that is into the next thing, as if nothing happened, and then we'll fix this in post, and you guys yeah. uh, won't tell anybody, Never right? Never happened. Um, so, you know, here's the thing. We were thinking about Steven Sinoski and Scott yeah. Forstall, both geniuses in their own right. You know, maybe not well-liked. Most geniuses aren't because they're so smart and handsome and talented. Uh, but um, we thought maybe this whole thing is a ruse. You know, they both quit right around the same time, mm -hmm. which seemed weird. Uh, and we started, you know, thinking maybe these guys are going to start something new together. Yeah. Maybe they're going to start their own new company to compete with Windows and, uh, and Apple, okay. with, with Microsoft and Apple. And uh, so um, we got some, we, we, we did some digging and we, we got some, some pictures of what we believe is yeah. photos of their new operating system that they're working on together uh, to compete with the big guys. Shocking. And, uh, and we're going to show them to you for the first time ever. You're the first people to see them. So, so quickly, before we get into that, I want to show you, this is Steven Sanofsky's work. This is the Windows 8. Home screen, you can see here it's, you know, uh, very stark. It's very iconic. You've got these, you know, big, bold text, big, bold icons. Uh, and, uh, you know, easy to navigate for most people if you have a touch screen. Uh, and then we have a photo of Scott Forstall's work. Uh, it's a little bit different, you know, but you've yeah. got the stitched leather, kind of controversial. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, OS 10 and iOS largely considered to be some of the most usable operating systems. Hey, you know what this is. You your, know what this is. You see it, it's a calendar. Is, I've ripped off a page. I'm in November. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is... Do you have a leather, leather calendar at home? I have, leather <laughs> I have a, a stack of leather calendars. So we found some, we found some pictures of what we believe is the, their, their, their project. Oh, here's iBooks. Yeah. Um, this is you know, the page turn. You know, it's skeuomorphism, but uh, at its best, mm -hmm. I think. So um, here's what we've uncovered, and we're pretty excited to show you guys. Uh, this is what we believe is the, yeah. the new home screen of the operating system that Scott cool. Forstall and Steven Sinoski are working on. Now, you can see the, the influences of both of them here. Right. Um, you've got this great tiled, you know, you've got all your apps right there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know there's mail, calendar, and, and the nice thing about this is unlike Windows 8, you know what they are just by looking at them. Yeah. That's a calendar. Yeah. Okay, there's a notebook. Everybody knows what a half faded out speaker means. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's... that's Audio, probably. You can, you can really tell a couple of jerks made. I mean, look at the look at the on-off switch here. Like, you're not gonna wonder how do I turn this thing off. Yeah. You click the on-off switch like you would on the back of a 386. Yeah. And uh, you know, the internet obviously. This is just is, like sitting down at your beautiful linen desk. Yeah. This is what work is like in the real world, right. but yeah. mixed with the the functionality and the fluidity of Windows 8. Yeah. I think it's quite brilliant. Let's take another. We have another look here. At, the, uh, at another app. Here's the browser. And I think when you think about where am I working, where am I looking at my content, it's on a table. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've got a notepad where you're making notes. Yeah, the table's made of a nice uh, you know, this to me is recycled wood. It's just, yeah, it's like a faded birch table. It's, just blending, the, it's blending the best of both worlds, mm -hmm. yeah. really. And I think we have one more shot. They're also doing mobile stuff. Do we have the mobile no, shot? Oh, no, we have oh, Skype. Oh, here's their version of Skype, which, by the way, I think is an improvement on the Skype interface. Um, <laughs> Actually, you know, it kind of is. <laughs> you know what you're getting. You know, you want to make a call, just, just click on the uh, rotary phone down there. Yeah. Uh, you know, you need to mute your mic, just click when on the... When this generation thinks of video, they think of giant They think school. of, uh, you know, yeah. you, I got to put this on UHF to tune in. <laughs> Sanofsky's calling, let me put it onto the UHF yeah. channel. And then finally, we have the mobile version, which they took a little bit of a different direction. Yeah, start. But, I think here you can see more of the, the Windows 8 influence mm -hmm. on, uh, on what they were doing with iOS. Right. I like the folders especially. The here. folders are great. It's I like mean, you I don't think... need to know what's in those. Yeah. Just, just open them up. That's yeah. what you do with a real folder, <laughs> yeah. right? Anyhow, there's the real pictures from the new project that Scott Forstall and Steven Zanowski are working on, and we're glad we could share them with you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah that's... <laughs> you know, <laughs> You know, we had, we had people working tens of minutes on those. <laughs> uh, so they really are going to, when they hear that applause, they're yeah. going to really lap it up. Uh, anyhow, uh, so we have, a, we have another video for you. Ross Miller went to Oblong Industries, and these are the guys who invented the Minority Report computer. They did the computers for Iron Man, um, and they basically are pushing computing forward in a big, big, weird, crazy way. Ross took a trip there, and um, we're going to take a look at that. And when we come back, we'll have John Underkoffler here. 
uh, who is their, uh, who is one of the big guys there, one of the main people. Chief scientist. Chief scientist leading this thing. Mm -hmm. So take a look at this. We'll be right back. I think that cinema is one of the great art forms and one of the great languages of obviously the 20th century and, and it's still serving us well here in the 21st century. I think it's actually important to study cinema for anyone who's building UIs, anyone who's building anything, anyone who's interested in communication. It's been 10 years since the film Minority Report came out. It is still the hallmark of the future of interface. These people at Oblong Industries in Los Angeles, they're the minds behind it. They made the interface and they're building it and making it a reality. Let's check out what they're doing. As much as Oblong is about product and technology, it's about ideas and, and it's important to be expressing those in every form that it's possible to think of. My name is John Underkoffler. I am a co-founder and chief scientist of Oblong. When I first saw John's work, it completely blew my mind and changed my view of what, what you could do uh, with a computer and take the user interface and put it all over the room and uh, you know, make, make the, the interactive experience sort of part of people's real world, not part of people's uh, you know, beige box. Starting in the kind of early 90s, so barely a decade into modern UI-based compute, computing, it seemed foolishly and naively to me that it was time for the next one, right? Why, why aren't we building the next UI? Ten years seems like long enough. And it seemed important to me that the, that the UI was the, the focus uh, of, of attention, right? Because the UI, at the end of the day, is all we have. Do you speak as Minority Report made flesh? This is a kind of typical installation uh, of the sort that um, we've been providing to our early adopter customers like Boeing and GE for, for many, many years now. Um, and it's a kind of development system inside which uh, you can solve problems that you can't solve any other way. GSpeak, the platform, is fundamentally input and output agnostic, but in this case we're using motion capture sensors that are specifically configured to look for these little tags. Each tag has a unique constellation of retro-reflective dots. It's basically 3M scotch light material. And it allows the system to recover the identity and the, th the three-dimensional position and orientation of each finger. It was an early revelation that the combination of incredibly uh, detailed position and orientation information with harshly quantized pose information makes a really, really robust system. That's what makes it so that it's uh, user independent. Anyone can put on these gloves and immediately be using the system. We don't have to train it per user. A lot of we have here. Ah, uh, being going in right now. Yeah. I think I'm going flat, yep. but not. Yep. And then, nice. There we go. So you know, we went from command line computing to graphical computing and that was a big wholesale shift in, in how you think about what it is to use a computer. We are making that same shift happen for today from just graphical computing on one screen to computing that is multi-user, multi-screen and multi-device. So this is Mezzanine. This is a conference room collaboration product that we make here at Oblong. So what you're looking at is a shared workspace where we've got a collection of uh, sequence content, which is a slideshow, it's what you're seeing in the, the middle of the screen here. Uh, a collection of assets that can be manipulated and added to the slideshow, like this one here. We've manufactured a set of three-sided wand input devices, which are used spatially to control our spatial operating environment. So you use these things as handheld products to drag something in space from one screen to another, or to manipulate an interface on one screen. There's two ways to build out new technologies. You can build kind of top-down the most capable possible version of the technology, and it starts out expensive. Or you can build bottom-up with inexpensive consumer class uh, devices that are probably not that capable but get better and better every year. We made a decision early on at Oblong that we would build, for, for a while at least, we would build top down. So we would build the most capable systems we could imagine and we would rely on Moore's Law and good engineering to sort of push those prices down year over year. So what we, what we knew we would see is the, the cost curve and the capability curves intersecting. I, I think we're right on the edge of that point and you can see that, that intersection between the cost and the capability curves. Our goal now is to kind of push through that barrier and get our version, our fully capable version of these spatial gestural multi-user interfaces out to everybody. So this is Seismo and it's an earthquake visualization in Sandbox. There is no gloves involved with this one. Right. So this is USGS data. and. Okay. It's, it's about 128,000 data points. So as you're noticing, you can, you can sit here and just grab and, and interact with the data. Uh, and there's a couple different ways that, that we can interact with it. So one is to just kind of grab it. If we flip around, we can set it back to kind of an equi-rectangular 
normal world map view. Okay, so wait, what was that? I'm actually going to wind. So it's okay. just a, a reverse L? Yeah. Okay, and then I can just hold my fist and kind of move it around. Correct. All right, All right. So this is going forward, this is going back. The operating environment thinks of real-world pixels, so you can put screens in your environment and basically use them as windows into a 3D virtual space as opposed to just kind of a continuation of a 2D space. It's been interesting for us to watch the evolution of interfaces around tablets and phones because there's been a lot of interesting work from Microsoft and Apple and, and, and the Android vendors. For us, what all that work so far is missing is the idea that it's an anachronism to look at one screen at a time and you know, view that as your computing experience. The next version of all of our computing experience is going to be multi-screen and multi-device. We have all these powerful screens and all these pixels all around us all the time. We need to use them more effectively. So in the next year or so, I think we're going to see a huge kind of efflorescence of gestural and spatial input uh, and more and more understanding among lots of different folks building computing experiences that multi-screen is really interesting. Oblong is dedicated to the idea that technology alone is no longer enough. Technology and design have to be conjoined, have to be inseparable, and have to be part of the same development process, otherwise we're not going to get anywhere valuable at all. Yeah, very, very cool. Very weird stuff. Uh, so please welcome the chief scientist for Oblong, John Underkopfler. Oh, you're coming out from over there. I was like, Dr. Tupolsky. Yeah. Yes. yes. I don't know why. I don't know why you'd be coming out from the other side. I originally, was going to be there. Now but it's there. The important thing is you made it over this barrier that we've put I did. around. I was hoping the to trip on the stage. Are it's you the getting first get, time I've had Are you getting fully nude here? Should I be? Do you want me to get fully nude? I, well, I've lit. I mean, it's up to okay, you to all right. the ante, right? No, I'm not doing that. Uh, so close, so close. Um, thank you for coming. Oh, my pleasure entirely. Uh, I mean, the stuff you guys are doing is fascinating. Thank you. And um, I want to know, so everybody, I mean, Minority Report is the thing that everybody talks about. And they talk about whether it's about you guys or just talking about the future of computing. Yeah, I think Minority that, like, Report is the thing. It that is. People are always like, oh, someday we're going to get that ball and we're going to be able right. to solve crimes before the ball, they happen. Yeah. And yeah. Okay, that's not you, but... No. What, what, what came first? Like, how did this happen? Like, did, did, did Steven Spielberg come to you and say, hey, I want this kind of thing, can you make it? And then you were like, hey, that's a great idea, we should make a computer like that. Or, I don't want to tell the story for you, you tell me, how did, it, how did this all come about? Was, which came first, chicken, chicken or egg? Uh, which, which one is the, the chicken? Wh that's what I want to know. Which yeah, one is right. the chicken? You tell me. Good. So, uh, I mean, it, it was in an ind indirect sense that uh, Spielberg wanted to put a real, a believable future of uh, HMI, of computation, into this movie that was going to be set in a putative 2054, uh, Washington, D.C. And it just so happened that a lot of the stuff that I and other folks had been building at the MIT Media Lab in the, in the mid to late 90s was what he was looking for. So he had sent an emissary, the amazing production designer Alex McDowell, to go on a kind of shopping spree and, and import technology directly into the film. And uh, what we were building at the Media Lab at the time seemed to be just the ticket. So Spielberg was like, I need a cool computer. Yeah, he said, I don't want to see a mouse. He was quite emphatic about it. And yeah. thank you for that, Stephen, right? I mean, that, what, what made him think he didn't want to see a mouse? Did he just think, like, obviously the mouse is going to be obsolete by the year 20, what is it, 2054? Yeah, that was his premise, and, uh, you know, he wanted to know what was next. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's deeply interested in technology. He was building this movie, uh, which, incidentally, he said is his film noir. It's not a sci-fi film in his mind, which is great. So it's set in the... Well, he yeah. may be slightly wrong, because <laughs> there's a lot of... Science fiction, <laughs> like straight up, li literally science Admittedly, fiction. Admittedly, and there's not much we can do about that, well, except know. celebrate it. The man's the, living in a fantasy world. The idea was that, um, you know, it was a film noir set only incidentally in 2054, and he wanted it to be a completely believable 2054, extrapolated from, you know, new technology trends that we can all recognize today, but discarding old, old, old stuff like the beige mouse. Right. So, so, so you had had, so how far along was whatever... Whatever they went shopping for and finally purchased, how far along was it compared to, well, obviously it wasn't what you see in the movie, but... It wasn't exactly that. We had fully working prototypes at MIT, though. Uh, so you, that, but you beat Spielberg to this. I mean, this isn't like he came to you and was like, I just wish I could do this all the time. Will I get in trouble if I agree? Uh, I, I don't know what Spielberg's like. Is he a vindictive guy? I can hear the black helicopters now. No, oh, he's really? A very, that very nice black man. He's great. No, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, so a sniper, we've been working a on that for a long time. Um, and, and so... 
Uh, did the movie help advance what you were doing when you when you had the the opportunity to kind of visualize this stuff in a yeah in no, CGI? No question. Was no it question. And, and in two ways? So um, you know we built the stuff in the real world uh, in an academic setting, and it was real code and real systems and and real physical objects that worked. Preparing it for the film was an amazing exercise because it, we had to render the stuff uh, legible. We had to simplify it. We had to make it absolutely smooth so that the audience could understand the kind of causal, this is how it works. Right. Uh, and that is you know, exactly the same exercise you should undertake if you're preparing a technological product or any product at so all. So the best thing to do if you're trying to build something new is to have Steven Spielberg make a movie around Yeah, I mean, it. just slip it into a $100 million film. It's like what I could easy. really use is a budget That's prototyping. to visualize this yeah. thing. Yeah, so, sure. you all, so you also did the, the Iron Man computers. Yes. And, yeah. and there are some similar, some similar stuff there. Yeah. What's great is that uh, Robert Downey Jr., who's really the, you know, the driving force behind all that is incredible. Incredibly smart and funny and profane guy as well. Um, he he wants to sort of, go hand in hand. They do. Okay. If you're Robert, they, he wants to up the ante each time and show a little bit something new. Uh, and he wanted to up the ante from from Minority Report, which is you know clearly a forebear for those kinds of science fiction interfaces. Right. So okay. So let me ask you. There's a scene in Iron Man where I don't remember which movie it is, but a scene I remember. He grabs something. He like throws it in the trash. He has to. He like physically, and then dumps it. Right. Like just like you would in the real world. Yeah. Now. In my experience, what's, it's a lot easier just to just to drag a mouse a little bit and then put it in the trash, and then it's, it's done. Like, you're done. You, I didn't have to use any muscles. But what if you don't have a mouse? The, the, but, but I'm saying, well, this is what I'm getting at. Like, why in, why in that situation or why in many situations where I'm computing, like a folder, yeah. for instance, like, it's really easy to put stuff in a folder, take stuff out of a folder. It requires very little... Uh, uh, movement from me, which yeah, I like because yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. extremely uh, weak. Mm. And... Uh, <laughs> How, in what way would a Minority Report interface or an Iron Man interface improve upon things like that, or will it? Or do you not even want to use it for stuff like that? Well, no, I think you do. I think you want to use it for everything. The, those, those films themselves aren't full prototypes in any sense, and that's what makes it a real-world product, is when all of those motions, all of those interactions have been refined and simplified and boiled down to their absolute essence. And there's, you know, there's an extent to which it's a cinematic exercise, and so you want Tom Cruise and Colin Farrell doing this all day long, uh, which has led to allegations that we've spent the better part of a decade trying to quash, which is that it's tiring to use these interfaces. And it probably is if you do it that way, but the fact is that, that we track hands to such incredible precision that when you use our systems, they're, they're very fine motions. And it's actually kind of freeing compared to doing this with a keyboard. So, so what is the impulse? I mean, just at the core, like, what is the impulse here that you want to, what do you want to change and why? Like, mm -hmm. why, why does the Minority Report computer need to exist? And I'm sorry if I'm calling it that. And like, I know you guys have names no, for fair. these things that are not Minority Report computer, unless that's what you're working with, which is fine. Like, why? Why, why do I want to change? Why do I not want to use? I mean, keyboard's very, a very efficient way to enter data, right? Yeah. Um, do I want to get rid of the keyboard? Do I want to get rid of the mouse? I don't think you want to get rid of the keyboard, but I do think you want to get rid of the mouse. So, so the keyboard has to stay. Uh, well, how are you going to type a letter to grandma? Can right? I just say it out loud? Y you could. You could. How's the uh, voice recognition stuff doing these days? I don't days? know. You're working on this stuff. You tell me. 8 percent Is that enough? <laughs> You're not doing any voice recognition? You don't think uh, that's yeah, part we, of, is that part of your system? We do integrate with, with that kind of stuff, and, it, and it's really, really useful as a kind of ancillary data input. But, but back to your question, I mean, uh, the, uh, we need to take that big step. It's been 30 years, and we're still stuck essentially with the same interface. It's the Macintosh interface, and, and here we are nearly 30 years later. We're hampered by it, frankly. It doesn't feel like it because there's a lot of you know, shiny pixels flying around, but we really are. The machines are capable of all sorts of incredible feats. We're still kind of grunting and squeaking and clicking, uh, as it were. So, so I wake up. Let's say your computer exists. I don't have a, I don't have a Mac anymore. Yeah. I've got... The oblong you MR, have architecture. MR You've got 64. Your room. You've got your real <laughs> so world. So I, I got space. I wake up in my bedroom. Now I want to check my email. Mm -hmm. What's the experience like in a, in a in an oblong world? It probably depends what you have near you. I mean, I think part of part of what we're saying is that, and this is really interesting. We're at the beginning of a massive change that uh, we're we're too close to to even understand. And it's the change. It's the transition from uh, an obsession with devices, like which device do you have? Do you have the little one? Do you have the big one? Do you have the tablet? Do you have the laptop? to an era of pixels. All that will matter is the pixels because the, the central premise is that you should be able to use any pixels you see anywhere and point at them or point at them with a phone or something else and by pointing at them, get through them to your stuff. Your I feel like you're, dodge, your you're dodging the question. No. How do I check I my dodge. email? 
How do you check your email? How am I going to check my email when I'm doing this stuff? Which pixels do you have near you? Well, I don't know. I, my wall is a computer. You Great. tell okay. me. Okay, yeah, I, your wall. You've got a. My bed is a computer. Don't... My duvet is a computer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I fold it down. Yeah, it's a 300 thread count computer. That's exactly. Right. It's yeah. extremely high resolution and also very soft on a nude body. Um, so, what, okay, so I don't know. You tell me, what would I, what would I wake up to? I think you might well, you know, drag a, pull a physical tablet off the bedstand or whatever. So you, I'm still doing this in you some, might, in yeah, some yeah, way. Yeah. Okay, so you're not ruling that out in your world. No, I mean, I think I think our answer at Oblong to all of this is plurality. But is there a right? better way to check email? Like, I, basically, I'm just trying to get my inbox to zero. So you need to tell me, <laughs> is there a better way? No, but I mean, have I you think envisioned... you're going to be chained to this desk your... and your inbox for the rest of your yeah, life. Just That's just because you this. But you but tell me, is there a better way that, in your opinion, so for something as mundane as checking email, which everybody does every day? Does this computer solve that or does this solve different problems? I guess that's my real question. I think it principally solves different problems. It enables new kinds of interactions that we can't even really dream up yet. Right. But you've dreamed some up. I've dreamed some up. Give me one. Give, give me, you an interaction? Give me a new interaction that these computers would allow us to do. Yeah, well, what would it mean for, um, let's say, you know, a bunch of smart grid management experts, people with a real world problem to solve, a hurricane comes in, smashes the city, um, there's electrical failures all over the place. What would it mean for all of those people to use a single application at the same time, bringing their expertise into the same room, using a whole panoply of monitors and displays and portable devices and tablets and projected wall screens to fix a problem. For them to be in the problem. For them to be in the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good example. I, you got me there. I'll be honest with you. I didn't think you were going to have anything. I mean, you've only been working on it for like, you know, 20 years, right? I mean, how long has it been? How long have you been working on this? Um, better part of three decades, I would have to say. So, so how do you feel about the Connect? I mean, are you, do you see the Connect as, as, as this is the future? Like, I'm, you know, I kind of set the stage for this, and now the Connect exists, and that's the first step. The to Connect getting itself? This, yeah, I mean, just because it's, it's a motion-controlled, it's the first motion-controlled thing that really is, has made any kind of impact in our lives. Yeah, that, that's true. It, it, but it's an input device, and I say bring it. Bring it all. Bring the Connect, bring the Leap, bring everything. Um, Oblong's operating system, which we call G-Speak, is designed specifically to take input from a heterogeneous bunch of devices like that. Depth-sensing devices, uh, pointing devices, spatial wands, these old guys, tablets, phones, all of it. That's how you get work done. You bring everything to the problem. And that's what's going to be new, the idea that work Play communication isn't stuck in one of these dev devices. That the, the stuff you're doing doesn't stop at the boundary of the device. Right. It's There's not like the edges stuck. of the window. It's like every, right. everything is the window. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do we get? How do we? How do we get there? And when do we get there? I mean, I went to Microsoft Research, and oh, I should actually. I have a, a Tom Cruise story. I mean, you obviously work with Tom Cruise on Minority Report, right? So I, I met him. I went to a, a taping of Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, and he was there. And we he's talked. Nice man. We, he's very nice, and we actually started talking. And he was like, "What's next?" Because you know, I'm a tech guy. He's like, "What's next? What's coming?" And I was talking about Microsoft Research because I'd just been there, and I was talking about all this gesture interface stuff. And he was like, "Oh, you know, we made a movie about that." Like very nonchalantly, <laughs> he's like, "You know, we made a movie about that called Minority Report." Um, but you worked with him closely, you know, did, did he, like, how did he take to it? I mean, here's a guy that's obviously not like a, a tech dude. Right. Um, was it natural? Were, do people respond to it naturally? Yeah, it was. I mean, he's incredibly professional and driven and, 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 and dedicated. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't, wasn't just him. We also uh, worked with Neil McDonough and, uh, and Colin Farrell because the early scenes that we'd shot with Tom were starting to look so good that, um, that Spielberg commissioned extra scenes to be written so that more people could use the technology. He wanted people using the computer. He wanted people to use that computer. But, but what we did is we trained the actors in every way we could because, you know, when you're shooting, the stuff isn't actually on the screens. The actors have to use their imagination. But these actors actually were the first users of G-Speak. The actual thing. In a, well, in a oh, sense. Oh, you mean right? in they, the virtual. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we made dictionaries and, uh, and training videos and so forth, and I spent days with all of them, you know, training them to use this doing, domain. Doing this stuff. That's right. So when it came time to shoot, they knew what they were doing. That's interesting. So now they could they go walk into your labs and, and just go for it. And be ready to go. Have yeah, any absolutely. of them come to your labs? They you, haven't yet. I think it's probably time. I right? think you should invite them. Yeah. Um, so okay. So when 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 can I when when will this be a thing that I can use in my real life? Like when will a human being who is not Tom Cruise, who is not just imagining it? You could be either one of those things. Well, Ross way. Miller's a human being, right? Well, not really. Um, <laughs> he's parts of him. He's uh, used it. <laughs> but I'm saying, like, when will I be able to say in my life, like, every day, day to day, I'm using this thing? Like, do you have a, do you have a, a, a is there an event horizon here? I don't even know if that's the right term. But... I like it. It's a great term. <laughs> yeah. I, I think so, yeah. I mean, so if you're, if you're uh, working in a, a series of sort of Fortune 500 
disciplines and domains, you may well be using it today. So we've got a bunch of customers who use GSpeak, who use our products. Who's, who use you, our who's using it? Uh, companies like Boeing and GE, Saudi Aramco. So they're literally like there's a room there's, somewhere yes. at Boeing where yes. guys are doing this stuff. A bunch of rooms, yeah. Really? Yeah. I gotta go to GE. Why yeah. am I doing this? Well, come to LA. Come to the lab. I would love to come to LA, and and uh, I'm going to come to LA. Okay. And I'm never gonna I'm gonna come to the lab and never leave. We can change you to the desk out there. That's great. I can yeah. finally deal with my inbox. Yeah. Um, I, I I so but you don't have a date where it's like available to consumers. Like you don't have an idea when this will be well, a we're, consumer we're, technology. We're inching and stepping and then sort of shambling our way there bit by bit. So uh, earlier this year we uh, launched a broad market product called Mezzanine, which brings those same capabilities to a kind of problem that everyone has, which is meeting rooms and conference rooms and how do you take the suck out of meetings. So that's something that... Yeah, if you could fi figure out a way to do that... It's a magic spray. You, you should see it. It's, it's good. It's called Ubic. Yeah, well, right. <laughs> Thank you for the PKD, PKD reference. Yeah, well, I try. So the, it, Mezzanine is going to end up in hundreds and thousands and eventually tens of thousands of meeting rooms, and those aren't Fortune 500 type problems. That's... That's like every. No, that's, a, that's like a verge meetings. problem. It's a verge problem. I mean, we're like go, else, when yeah. we hear like go to the, we get a go to meeting dial in, we get very depressed. So, like, is this going to improve my go to meeting experience? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. <laughs> well, that's very exciting. Yeah. Listen, I wish we had more time to talk, but unfortunately, we have to wrap up. I'm we're sorry about along. that. I had so much to talk. Do you, about do you, is there is there is there anything that we didn't get to that you wanted to get to? You a brought a, amount, you brought a computer uh, and a movies, jacket and a notepad. I brought a notepad. Is there any particular reason? That you brought the stuff out. Well, I wanted to talk about science fiction and movies. Let's, let's um, talk also about let's, cuffs and you get, uh, wait, did you, you say cuffs? Cuffs, yeah. My wife said you can't you're wear pointing cuffs. You're to your oh, you're pointing to your leg. But I was you're like, wearing hand, cuffs. I was and like, that's hand what I want cuffs? America to know. I was. I, I do have my jeans cuffed. That is true. Yeah. Do you want to just I check your email you. really quick here? No, it's not the email. <laughs> I, you know, you were you were talking about shaving earlier, and I'm in big trouble today because. Today, November 20th, is Oblong's pencil-thin mustache day. What? And I am not participating. Yeah. By so the way, this is unplanned. I don't know what's happening right now. Here's, here's a few of our designers and engineers. They, oh, they all have mustaches. Pencil-thin mustaches. Including a, a, what appears to be a woman. Yes. <laughs> That's um, unusual? It, were, there, were there hormones involved in that it, mustache growing? I think perhaps just So do you, are you going to shave? I will if you will. Uh... <laughs> Um, you want me to shave my mustache into a pencil yeah, thin just mustache? Because what could be weirder than Do you have a second this? razor? Yeah, well, we can share. Is this actually happening right now? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I mean, I've got, do I, I just keep, I keep the you beard. You keep all though. this. Okay, you it go just, first. <laughs> can go someone on, out go there on. tell me if I can trust this man? I'll wait, go ahead, shave. Wait, you want me to shave just out of the blue? Yeah. Yes. My mother yeah. just audibly said no, by the way. <laughs> um, look. I'll tell you what. Let's meet in L.A. Let's do we'll this. We'll have a camera crew, and we're going to have razors, two of them. Okay, I'll, I'll, I, will, I will hold you to that. We okay. will do pencil-thin mustaches in Great. L.A. Uh, look, I need uh, shaving cream, and also I'm scared to death of having a pencil mustache. So, <laughs> John, thank you so much for coming. Really Great awesome. Pleasure. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, sir. And... Uh, Stick around. That was weird, and I didn't know that was coming. I will share. I didn't either. But you were um, talking about shit. Stick around. We've got a word from our sponsor featuring Paul Miller, and we'll be right back uh, with Torsten Hines' interview. I'm Paul Miller, and I'm spending a year without using the internet. So to stay in touch with people, I've got a PO box, and they uh, they send me letters. I send them letters back. It's a Paul Miller. It's a Paul Miller. It's a Paul Miller. It's a Paul Miller. I've got a key. It's a Paul Miller. It's a Paul Miller. What's got me thinking is this key. I actually don't normally receive keys, and I, I, I don't think it's to another P.O. box because it says Ford on it, so. Oh, well, would you look at that? I think that's Ford's new Fusion. Well, the key works. So one of the great things about receiving mail is that people typically put their return address right on the envelope. But then you can drive to that address and you know, extend, extend your friendship with that person. One of my best offline friends is this guy named Mike, and he lives way up on the Upper East Side. I'm a downtown guy, it's a bit of a trek on my bike. So, you know, now that I've got this Ford Fusion, I think I'm gonna pay him a visit. Call Mike. Calling Mike on cell. Hello? Hey. Hey, Mike. Yeah, what's up? Hey, this is your pen pal, Paul. How's it going? I'm outside of your house right now. You are? Yeah, I am. Do we have the right place? 
So we decided to go see a movie, but uh, you know, the snacks are a little overpriced, so we, you know, we're gonna stock up, so. This is delightful. These are huge apples. Like a little salad. All right, we're ready for, for the ultimate movie experience. We've got carrots, we've got onions, we've got donuts, we got our coffee. Now we just gotta get there. I already put this as a favorite. I will set that as my destination. So this is active park assist. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever uh, witnessed somebody um, active park something before, but it's kind of amazing. It's gonna search for a spot. Oh, here we go. Go right. forward to park. We got this, we got this. Our hands off the wheel. We're not doing anything. The car is parking. Job complete. Nice. Let's watch a movie. Okay, let's do this. You know, Mike, I'm glad it worked out. I'm glad when I showed up at your house bizarrely and randomly uh, and then called you from my car that you were into it and that we had a good time. All right, I got a blind spot detector. Is there a friendship detector? <laughs> you know what? I don't need a friendship detector to know that this is gonna work. All right, man. I had a great time. Yeah, it's been I fun. I think we should do this again. We definitely should. Here, let me, let me get the, let me get the uh, door all right. for you. All right. Oh, I hope you have you. a great day, you Thanks, know? Thanks, man. I, you have a good time, too. Yeah. And I, 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 I've just been, I've just been told that Paul's new friend is here in the audience somewhere. Could, could we get a hand raised where, right there? there? Oh, look, it's like, so wonderful when people get together and hang out and then come to a show and stare. Uh, anyhow, um, we have a really interesting interview. Uh, a few months ago, I sat down with Torsten Hines and I wrote a, a little story about um, when, when Research in Motion was just starting to talk about their new devices and uh, BlackBerry 10. Uh, and, you know, they had recently delayed the stuff and they pushed it back. They're now getting set to release this uh, whole new operating system, all these new products. And uh, Dieter Bone, our, one of our West Coast editors, sat down with Torsten, the CEO of the company, in uh, San Francisco. And uh, it's a pretty interesting interview. So take a look at this. And we will be right back with some very, very, very special stuff. Everybody knows it's been a bad few years for RIM. But the company's coming up at a defining moment with the launch of BlackBerry 10 and all new modern smartphones. We sat down here in San Francisco with CEO Torsten Hines to find out a little bit about what's coming on the launch and see what he thinks it'll take for RIM to get its mojo back. Well, Torsten Hines, thanks so much for uh, speaking with us. It's a real pleasure. We've spoken to you a few times now, and uh, the big news most recently is you guys announced that you're launching BlackBerry 10 on January 30th? Correct. That is the announcement. You made the decision to push back the launch mm -hmm. after Q4 and into Q1 of 2013, and so you'll be missing the, uh, the holiday season. Can you talk a little bit about what made you decide to push back the launch into 2013? The major argument really was we, we're not just building a next update of a smartphone OS, right? We're not moving from BlackBerry 7 to BlackBerry 8. Mm -hmm. We've built a whole new platform. Nothing that's in BlackBerry 10 on the software side has anything to do with what's in BlackBerry 7. So it's a huge undertaking to build a new platform. And we're really, really looking at this as a platform taking us into the next decade. You need time to get it right. You need time to polish it. When, it. when it's out there, I want it to be a wow experience in the user's hands. That was the first argument. The second one was that Q4 is going to be pretty crowded with launches. It's the typical holiday season. And um, the question we had then with our carriers when we discussed that was, you know, is it, is it too much noise, right? If you know, all these uh, products launch at the same time, Kara said, you know what, Q1, why don't you go for it? They want the quality, so they supported us in that decision. And we can give you full attention in, in, in Q1. What's the 10 second pitch for BlackBerry 10 as opposed to iPhone, Android, or even Windows yeah. Phone? Okay, you're, you're a user, hyper-connected, always on multitasking, and you need to get things done. Mm -hmm. How do we do this? The best typing experience on a keypad, we have the full integrated hub, so your brain is not occupied with any in and out or which application do I have to open. And if you're connecting your device to an enterprise, we have BlackBerry Balance that makes your personal part of the device full private, 
and allows the CIO to have a fully secure corporate part on the same device. Windows Phone has a, a very uh, concise pitch. We have the start screen with live tiles, and you feel like you can get in, get out, get out of your day, whatever mm -hmm. they call it. Um, do you think that you've got uh, that's a compelling enough reason for someone to choose BlackBerry over another platform? I think it's it's the user experience that will finally make that decision, mm -hmm. right? And with the hub and all of the integration of all your communication channels, all your notifications into one central hub, which is not an application, right? It always right. runs on that device. It's always at your fingertips. And it's always just one, one swipe away. Wherever you are on this device, you just do this one gesture and you're in your activity center, right? And you take activities on all your channels, be it Facebook, Twitter, email, BBM, whatever you have, right? Notifications out of the hub. So there's no need to say back Facebook, obey, back LinkedIn, back BBM, right? And I think that is so compelling because right now people are really getting overwhelmed by all the different channels they have to deal with. Right? They're hyper-connected. And we just make this so easy and comfortable with them. I, I think that's going to just speak for itself. The big question, of course, is apps. And you oh, recently yeah. said that you're aiming for 100,000 apps at mm -hmm. launch. How are you going to get to that number? That's a pretty big number. Well, we have pretty good line of sight to get there. You heard about the 30 jam conferences mm -hmm. that we did globally. And the way we look at this is, and we learned this from um, our presence in Asia, PAC, and Middle East, and South Africa, applications are also local. So the first attempt is, in every of our major countries, get to the 200 to 600 most important local apps. So really work with the local app developer community. Okay. This is why we did this in 30 countries. And then the generic um, applications like you know, games, uh, content, video, music, books, uh, so we are deeply integrated with Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. It's not just an application, it's really deeply integrated into the device. That's one thing. Uh, second is we have built a BlackBerry 10 platform with various software developer toolkits on it, Flash, Air, HTML5, uh, C, C++ native, and then we have an Android player. With Android apps, uh, the way that you executed that on the Playbook OS is relatively interesting. The developers still need to submit them directly to the BlackBerry store. Yeah, because we want this to be part of the BlackBerry app world, right? right. The BlackBerry world, but uh, they don't have to do a lot of coding or anything. They, they submit it, it gets converted into the BlackBerry app world uh, file format. Mm -hmm. um, they need to agree on the commercials and, and uh, sign up for that. Uh, we test it for quality, for sure, right? So we take a look at that, and then it's there. I'd like to go back and uh, talk about the competition a little bit. Uh, Microsoft, it seems, has really gone after you guys uh, with Windows Phone 8. They've got the whole new kernel and platform that's tightly integrated with a whole bunch of their, their Windows services mm -hmm. and especially their, their enterprise services for device management. How are you guys going to counter Microsoft to ensure that uh, Windows Phone kind of doesn't eat your lunch? I have a lot of respect for, for all companies working in this space because they all have good engineers, they all have creative people, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's about the, the smartphone market in the US is a very mature market, 60% penetration by now, right? Whereas in other regions we sit at 20. Mm -hmm. Um, so, if you are in a mature market, you need to segment it, you need to find your bullseyes segment. We have identified this for the BlackBerry user with those three criteria, and it's not us you know, putting this on paper academically. We did an intense user study about this for, for, for weeks and months, which is you're hyper-connected, you're multitasking, and you need to get things done. Mm -hmm. So, you're probably not using the device to game or to watch TV shows. Now, we've got to be good at that, because that's the consumer decision element, right? But the hub, the flow, the peak, the balance, that is all geared towards this segment that roughly is kind of about 50% of, of the smartphone users. Um, and that's what we're aiming at, and that's where we compete. The second thing is, I truly believe in mobile computing. I predict that over time, laptops really will disappear. Go into a meeting today and see what people carry into a meeting, right? So sometimes when you have discussions with your financial teams in a company mm -hmm. you know they, they are the Excel spreadsheet gurus and they come with a big laptop right but in general I think we are we're up to mobilize the, the the enterprise and in my view a smartphone and or a tablet is going to be good enough for 50 60 percent of all mobile workers of all employees um, in a corporate enterprise and that's also what we're shooting at what is your metric of success for BlackBerry 10 uh, if you know, if we talk again in six months, what will be the thing that says, you know, yes, we're doing, we're on the right path. This is going well, or no, this isn't going well. I think it is clearly making a mark in the market. So you know, being being attractive to consumers and to enterprises, selling the device in mm -hmm. certain quantities is is a measure of success, no doubt, right? 
successful global launches, um, a good sound marketing campaign around it that attracts consumers, and then we will ramp it up, right? So um, that to me is the next six months, and then BB10 will proliferate into the portfolio, so there will be new products we probably can talk about in a few months mm -hmm. from now that Black Britain will be. And it is, again, it is also for me, the exploration of the mobile computing domain. So I have several projects, innovation projects running right now in the company where we want to you know, start building this, this mobile computing experience. Well, thank you very much. Good luck with the launch. Oh, thank you, Dieter. And, Appreciate uh, it's it. It's been great talking with you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's Torsten Hines. He really knows how to bring it home. He does. Well, that's it. We've come to just about the end of our uh, last show of the season. And uh, it's been a crazy year. It's been a crazy year, and, and as we get close to Thanksgiving, I think we all have a lot to be thankful for. Paul, anything that you want to say you're thankful for? As a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. I have uh, a new niece. Ooh. Oh, yeah. And a new nephew. Oh. Both two, two, two new relatives in one month. That's a, that's a hell of a month. And also, I got a Wii U. <laughs> That's even better than new relatives. That's, really awesome. That's uh, a big improvement over relatives. Yeah. Neil, anything uh, you'd like to say you're thankful for? I was married, so uh, my wife. But really, your continued health. Oh. May you survive. Wow, for that long is so sincere. Time. I love it. That is so. That is. <laughs> well, well, so planning. yeah, I'm very, well, who knows, I could go at any moment. So we're all uh, Josh living. Yeah, we're so happy about me being alive. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for my wonderful wife as well, uh, and my family. Yeah. Uh, and I have to say, I'm really thankful for you guys here, and who, the people who read the site. Give yourselves a round of applause. You deserve it. And, uh... You know what, I'm really thankful for the Verge team. Let's get the Verge team out here. We're out. And give me, yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Yes. Bring it in. Bring it up. Bring it up. And uh, that's our show. Thank you guys so much for coming. I want to thank John Undercoffler and Ford, our sponsor. And uh, we'll see you guys in 2013. Happy Thanksgiving. Come on, bring it. Let's go.